and so it shall be. join you and help you fulfill God's plan for your life. I feel this in my bones, people. For you, I'm feeling it. I'm telling you. We've got to display the ministry of the Spirit today. Something that is so incredibly powerful to change the world. We must not lose today's opportunity to reach the whole world for Jesus Christ. This is your love world.
Hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, we honor you, we magnify you. And Lord, in this praise a thon, what we're going to do is give you the praise for what you have done, who you are. Oh, you are mighty in all of your ways. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Father, because of all of your marvelous works toward men and we praise you for these things hallelujah hallelujah oh my goodness gentlemen and and pastor osay come on up here by me you got to beautify the set good morning love world singers good morning love world band good morning everybody that is with us or good evening Uh, if it's it's evening in chicago or the middle of the night or wherever you're watching we love you so so much i tell you i reverend tom I was so affected yesterday when Pastor Chris was talking about what praise is and what praise is not. My, it was like my mind just it was exploding that you can't just say, I praise you, Lord. I was trying to go to sleep last night and I was thinking, that makes such sense. How come nobody taught me that before? All these years. All these years. I said, I, it made such sense to me. You can't just say, I praise you, Lord. Which, you know, many of us, that's how we were raised. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. He said, you've got to say what for. You've got to put that on there. You know, Pastor has taught us the, we can't just, but we keep saying thank you, thank you, thank you to our dear man of God, Pastor Chris, because he's, he's taking the church in the right direction yes. of true worship and praise. What we thought was praise and worship before he showed us. I mean, God tolerated all these things for so long. But now this is true praise and worship. We don't, we, he, I mean, it's as simple as he said it. Now you look like, how could I have said I praise you, Lord? Where is the praise? Mm-hmm. It's like I say, I give you. Where is what I've given you? When I give you something, I don't say I give you. I give it to you. Yes. So the man of God has taught us. And then he's also taught us the right way to address the Lord Jesus. You know, uh, when you're talking to him, then he said, you must say, Lord, and just call his name. He is king, he's Lord, and he's master. That makes a whole lot of difference. And, and I can feel like uh, love all singers and the man of God, Pastor Chris, are going to lead praise in heaven. Because, <laughs> because yeah, because these songs if you just read the lyrics of the songs you will be a super christian mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes because there are messages on the uh, you know each each line They're a sermon yes each one is a sermon. yes and i tell you that just transformed my life i could hardly go to sleep last night i kept I trying to think of imagine. all the things i wanted to tell the lord i praised him for i said lord i don't want to just say i praise you i praise you for your goodness i praise you for your long suffering i praise you for your mercy and it makes a difference it makes a whole lot of difference it makes a difference oh my heavens and i know that you were so blessed by all of this this week every session has just been amazing and giving god the glory for that and I tell you, Dr. Mike, you've been over at the, yes. at the sanctuary yes. with Dr. John Avanzini, and I was watching some of that when we finished programming here yesterday. You all have had an amazing time over amazing there. Amazing time, and the people over there have just been explosively glad to hear the word <laughs> of the Lord. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, I, we didn't want to leave. We just wanted to keep it going, and then we got in the car. We're watching the service here, and it was an amazing 24 hours in the word of God. It really was. I was watching Dr. John Avanzini. Avanzini, you all were trying to go off the air, and he had his jacket off and his vest on. See and, dancing, I, and he was up there, and he was he was leading the praise and worship to the to the Lord for the mighty things the Lord has done. And I was like, I, you know, he, he's got to be at least fifty nine years old. Yes, <laughs> and there he was. I thought, no excuses. Praise God that you can live to that age, full of yes, life yes, and health, and Lord. that. 
full of joy, and that is God's will. Pastor Osei, come on over here. How are you this morning, Pastor Osei? I'm excellent. Thank you. Amen. I don't want to take you back, but I just wanted to read the scripture that um, Pastor read from yesterday, Hebrews 13, 15, from the Amplified Version. It says, through him, therefore, let us constantly and at all times offer up to to God a sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of lips that thankfully acknowledge and confess and glorify his name. Just to portray what Reverend Tom was talking about. And it was just stuck in my head all night. And that amplified version really brings brings the... Yeah, that was it for me. Yeah, that was it, the amplified version. And it was just joyous and glorious. And then I tell you, last night, Pastor Benny, the teaching... Oh, the cost of a sacrifice, and then he went into talking about honor. The value that you place on it. What if you place no value on it, how could God how, place How could it? God place a value on it? Yeah. And that, that's what the man of God, Pastor Chris, has taught us over the years. You don't just give what you want to give. It's got to be what God wants and what has value. You don't give what has no value to you. So, it, and then he, he talked about honor. God said, if I be a father, where is my honor? Yeah. So you don't bring sacrifices with blemishes, things that you don't want to bring to. He is God. That's right. He is God, and he blessed us with everything. God deserves the best, not your best. Your best may not be good enough, but the best. That's it. That scripture, I will not offer that which costs me nothing. nothing. That, that changes my life right there. I leaned over to you while Pastor Benny was, was ministering, and I said, when he started telling the story about the king of Jordan, I said to Pat, Reverend Tom, I said, have you heard this story before? I've heard it so many times, I it. but I love to hear that story because it really, it really makes it uh, apropos when, when Pastor Benny tells the story. If you didn't get to hear it, I hope you get to go back and watch one of the replays when he tells about meeting the king of Jordan. And he picked out this Mont Blanc pen that would have been, by anybody's standards, amazing. Yes. But the difference was, it's for a king. Yes. When it's for a king. It's got to be it, what it should be. And the best in the city, there was nothing else in the city that would compare to that gift. And, you know, I could feel, while Pastor Benny was ministering, I could feel that when he was uh, talking about that, by the time he took that pen and he said he swiped his American Express for $25,000, you know that did a little something in the bottom of his stomach, like, oh, swiping that, oh, oh. That's sometimes the way that can make you feel, that if but if it's really significant, it will, it will do something to you. There have been moments I walked away from the altar when I had laid that the greatest thing, the greatest thing that I could lay there, and I laid away. I'll, I'll tell you, when I walked away, I felt a little pain. I felt a little pain because it was not just something. It was everything. It was everything. You know that you... Oh, God, I feel the Holy Spirit here already. Dr. Payne, come here. Because you'll know that it meant something to God when you feel that kind of a feeling with the seed. And you are the, what did we say yesterday? The apostle. The apostle apostle of of seedonomics. Seedonomics. If it really means something to you, it will affect you. I've literally walked away with Linda. We've laid something on the altar, and we've walked away, and I thought, Oh, God. Oh, oh Lord, I, my, my trust and my hope is in you. It cost me something. And when it costs you something, it does something to you. You know, uh, God don't determine uh, what you give by what you give. He determines it, the value by what you have left. Uh. So if I've got $1,000... And that's all I have, and I give that. That's more than someone that's got a hundred thousand and give a thousand. That's right. That's right. So God determines the value. It's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. Equal sacrifice. And the value is determined by what you have left. Ah, my, my. And Psalms 126 says, 
uh, they went forth weeping, mm. bearing precious seeds. Yeah. But they came back shouting with the harvest. <laughs> and the cheerful giver, yes. the cheerful giver yes. a lot of times is not when they sow. The cheerful giver becomes cheerful when the harvest comes That's back. That's it, yes. And so uh, I thought Pastor Benny did a masterful job last night of talking about the value oh, it, of the seed. There's a protocol to come into the presence of a yes, king. Yes, yes. That's it. And if you don't meet the protocol, hey, then, you don't, then you don't receive the blessings of the king. And there's a protocol, and I thought Pastor Chris uh, did a masterful job of teaching on praise. I guess I had never thought about what he said, that we just don't say praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord, for the health that we have, for the glory that you let yeah. us enjoy. Attach something presence. to it. You attach that to your praise. Yes. And I've, I've always felt like sowing was worship. Uh, Matthew 6, 21 says that uh, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So if I bring my treasure to the Lord, I'm bringing my heart to the Lord. I'm surrendering my heart to the Lord, uh -huh. not just my seed. Uh, my, my affection is in my seed, and that moves the heart and the hand of God. What are you going to minister on today? Just and, and Bishop, you get going, and we got to pull you back in. So just a little, a little tease of it, okay? What are you going to minister on today? On seed. Well, really, <laughs> I couldn't have figured that out with Bishop James Payne. <laughs> you asked me to be brief. Seed. Bishop Payne, I love to hear you teach on seed. You know, I, I was telling telling my wife last night, as many years as I've been doing praise a thons and, and you know, I love to raise funds for the kingdom of God and encourage people to give. And about the time I think I've heard every sermon, every teaching that there can possibly be, you'd think that I would be burnt out on wanting to even come and hear it again. But I tell you, I live for it. I hunger for it. I'm thirsty for it. People who love Jesus, I'm going to say something here. People who really love Jesus love to hear teaching on giving and the seed and harvest. And what, what you preached on yesterday. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. The yet. The yet. Ah, the yet. One word. The yet. One word will change your I, life. I don't want to stay you up again. <laughs> the yet seed. And the nail from the day before that. A nail. Oh, our, so our, oh a nail in a sure place. Praise God. Ooh, well, you know, it. Reverend Tom, you are a nail in a sure place. And I know you're not comfortable when somebody gives you accolades, but I appreciate you being a nail in a sure place. I'm so grateful for it. And then I looked at Pastor Kay. I, I, I don't know how Pastor Chris has done it picking out it just Holy Spirit led to pick out everybody. I look at the singers, the Love World singers, who always look yeah. just absolutely amazing and sound absolutely amazing. And then I look at the, the staff and Pastor Kay, your humility. You are truly a nail in a sure place. How blessed have you been this week, sir? We're so happy you're here this morning, sir. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Pastor Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a million. Uh, I just want to, you've spoken about what everyone said. I just want to say something quickly about what Bishop Clarence said. On Monday, now he made an amazing statement when he talks about, he talked about the blessing. Mm, he yes. said that you can be blessed, but for you to be a blessing, you yeah. must be a giver. That's right. That's amazing. You know, we, we, when we think about all the folks in the Middle East, the sheikhs are very wealthy they are blessed but for them to be a blessing they must be givers then yesterday he mentioned he defined blessings and he mentioned some things about blessings he mentioned what blessings are fruitfulness multiplication fullness subducation dominion amazing amazing that's why i said about the time you think you've heard it all then you hear something and you think my heavens I literally hunger and thirst 
for God. And I hunger and thirst for the teaching that we're receiving this week. Dr. Mike said he's going to teach today instead of preach. And something in me said, praise God. Because you know, I, you know I'm going to act crazy and I'm going to be jumping around and hollering no matter what. It's just in me. That's what it is. But I hunger and I thirst for that teaching uh, on it. And Dr. Mike, you do such a tremendous job on it. What are you going to teach on today? I'm going to preach on our inheritance, a part of the three. I'm now, are you going to preach three. or are you going to teach? You said I'm, teach. I, I got to do a little bit of both. A little both. All good preaching contains teaching. <laughs> oh, okay. So All right. Yes. Got to do a little bit of both. But we're going to talk about three parts of the inheritance that we already now possess in Christ. Can't give all of them, of course, but we're going to highlight three. Well, I can't wait to hear this. And I want you to know, dear friends, our Love World partners and our Love World family, Pastor Chris loves you so, so much. I, you know, people don't see behind the scenes sometimes. Pastor Chris, last night, we were leaving, and he he was walking out with us. He's trying to open doors for us, get us in the in the vehicles. And we're like, Pastor Chris, you've got you've got so many people helping you. But it's his heart of love, our man of God, Pastor Chris. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for loving all of us and your grace, sir, and your mercy in all of our lives. We're forever grateful. Pastor Benny, you know, I was telling Bishop Payne, I, I pray that that voice, God sustains Pastor Benny for so many more years because I don't want that voice to leave the earth. There are two, two people that I just cherish in my life, my mother and Pastor Benny, and their voices, their voices. And I think I've prayed for three people this week, my mother, Pastor Chris, and Pastor Benny. Lord, let their voices stay on this earth. We need their voices to be heard for our generation. So Pastor Chris, man of God, we cherish you. We love you. Thank God for your voice. Pastor Benny, thank you. May the Lord sustain you for so many years to come that you're able to keep bringing us great teaching like you brought us last night. Well, I tell you, it is going to be a full day of worship. You know what, Pastor Osei, people could call even right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's our different ways the, the, of, of giving? What's our platform? The, cent- the call center is already. You can call the number to give, and then we have um, online. You can give online. And the information's you on your screen right SPs. now. SPs, you can give through Kingspay. Right. There are several methods of giving. And if you scan the QR bank, code. Bank transfers. Bank, bank transfer, transfer, yeah. Yes, so if you, if you scan the, some, the QR code, you'll be open to the world of uh, different uh, yes. platforms. Platforms yeah. for payment. And you know, it's not just calling to give. When you call, our prayer partners are going to partner with you. And they're going to pray with you. They're going to believe God with you. And just to hear that comforting voice. Yesterday when uh, we were in the prayer center, and you all prayed, were back prayed so with much. a whole lot of them. Uh, yes. The phones were ringing they were and just ringing. ringing off the whole way, running around, you know, who to pick what they were it was just continuous well they had a split screen we could see you all out here and we we saw you just phone after phone after phone and i think that's the comforting thing reverend tom is that people aren't just calling to give but you can have somebody to agree with you in prayer and we really we really want to do that that is pastor chris's vision here at love world and that's why pastor benny's vision is to do these praise-a-thons that we can be able to partner with you and pray with you so call us right now we're waiting for you our prayer partners are waiting for you all over the world we have call centers all over the world and it's our greatest joy to get to pray with you. I tell you what, we are ready and fired up and ready to go today. Love World Singers, are you ready? Let's go right now to the Love World Singers, lifting up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.
I magnify you, Lord. You fill my life with joy and pleasures evermore. I exalt you.
wherever you are right now. Wherever you are right now, wherever you are, just raise your hand and tell him, you are my all. You are my all. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, Jesus, you are our all and our all. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy, your long-suffering, your tender compassion. You are my all. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, glory, glory. I tell you, you can sense the presence of our Lord Jesus right now. It, it, it's so palpable that you can, you can just feel it encompassing you and surrounding you. Whatever you're facing today, you're not alone. Dear Jesus is right there with you. Love World is here to pray with you and stand with you. And I just got to tell you, Love World band and Love World singers, I love you so, so much. I love you. And, and, and I, I'm just going to tell you, here's how we say it in Chicago. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, that's how we say it. And I don't know if, if you can, you're, you're all kids and young, way younger than me. So I'm sure though that Pastor Chris has talked about TBN and pa uh, Pastor Jan and Paul Crouch. And I, I, I'm sure you've heard of them. I was standing here and I told Reverend Tom just a moment ago, uh, Jan Crouch would have loved you all. I was, I sang with her the week before she passed away at Holy Word Studios in uh, Orlando, Florida. And I, I stood here on the stage thinking, I wish so bad Jan and Paul Crouch could see this and be able to see you all. She would have loved, loved, loved how radiant and debonair that you all look because her, her mantra was doing it five star for the kingdom of heaven. And you all are just, you're just five star. That's all there is to it. <laughs> well, I tell you from Dallas, Texas, 13 books that Dr. Mike Smalley has written. My goodness, I wish, I, someday I'm going to be that smart. And I think one of the things I love about you the most, Dr. Mike, is to know that you've been mentored by Dr. Mike Murdoch. Uh, he, he has been a mentor of yours and spoken into your life for so many years. We've been so blessed. Dr. Mike and I have known each other uh, for 116 years now. We go back 116 years. Don't we look good for that long a Abraham period Abraham Lincoln time? was president when we met. <laughs> Dr. Mike, we love you. Thank You have literally transformed our lives with your teaching on giving and sowing. And so from Dallas, Texas, would you please help me welcome on behalf of Pastor Chris and Pastor Benny, would you help me welcome Dr. Mike Smalley? Come on, Dr. Praise Mike. The Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I just felt real stirred as the Love World singers continue to play the keyboard. I felt real stirred as we were singing a moment ago. Before I was to teach, I was to open the door for those of you who have never met Jesus Christ. Felt so stirred that someone was watching. You may be channel surfing and just landed on this television network seconds ago. Don't even know who we are. Maybe you've watched a few times or channel pass. I don't know. Here's what the scripture says. You know the word conscience. Con means with. Science means knowledge. Conscience means with knowledge. God put a conscience in all of us. You can go into a nursery of two and three year old children who can't speak, can't read and write, and one of them will take a toy out of the other one's hand. They'll instinctively look up to see who saw them do it because they know they shouldn't have done that. God put a conscience in us to know right from wrong and every one of us have chosen to do wrong. And so we needed a Savior. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, died on the cross, rose from the dead, paid the penalty for your and my sin. In short, you and I broke the law. Jesus paid our fine so that you and I could experience it. A lot of people talk about Christian rules, you know, and so we, we don't do this, we don't do that. Christianity cannot be brought down to a changed life. Christianity is an exchanged life. You get his perfect record in place of your imperfect record. You get his righteousness in place of your unrighteousness. And the scripture says so clearly, just like this in Romans chapter 10, if I will confess with my mouth, you have to say it, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. There it is on the screen for you. Leave it up there if you would, please. 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. So there's your salvation recipe. You can't write a check to be born again. You can't feed enough poor people to get born again. You can't do enough good deeds. It's very big view in the United States that as long as my good deeds outweigh my bad, I'll make it to heaven. That's not how it works. You have to come by the way of the cross. And I just feel so stirred. You're ready right now. You're ready right where you are. You're listening to me on a handheld device. You're on your way to work. You've got your Bluetooth headphones in. You're watching on traditional television. Maybe you're watching a year from today. Maybe you're watching live right now. But the fact that you're hearing my voice, you know you can't go another week like the week you just had. You know you can't keep making the same decisions. Somebody says, well, I've done too much. Nobody's done too much. Jesus said, whoever will, let him come and drink freely of the water of life. You see, there's a seat at the table of the Lord for you. So I'm going to lead you in this prayer, and then I'm going to teach on the inheritance that we have in Christ. And after you pray this prayer with me, you'll be in Christ too. So you'll learn three things that you're going to instantly inherit. Because this is a good God. This is an amazing Jesus. I wouldn't get out of bed for three seconds in the morning for religion. Religion's been boring to me my whole life. But Jesus has never been boring to me for one second. He's life itself, and he's hope, and he's love. So I want to lead all of us in a prayer. Everyone here in the studio, the Love World singers and the staff behind me, they're all going to say it with us out loud together. And I'm going to lead you in a salvation prayer because what point would praise a be if we didn't get everybody in the kingdom while we could? That's why we're here. That's why we exist. We're getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out all around the world. And praise a is about you and I scheduling our harvest so we can help finance the Great Commission all around the earth and be a blessing to our family, our church, and the work of God. So say it aloud with me right where you are. Don't close your eyes. Leave them open like you're talking to Jesus right physically in front of you. Just see him there with your spirit man eye. Say it out loud. Lord Jesus, I come to you now. Come on, I want everybody in the studio. I want to hear all of you. Ready? Let's start again. Ready? Lord Jesus, I come to you now. I know I've sinned. I don't blame anybody else. I've known right from wrong, and I've chosen wrong. I've sinned, and I need a Savior. So right now, by an act of my will, I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of all of me. I believe in my heart. He died on the cross, rose from the dead, and is alive today, listening to my prayer. And according to his word, which cannot lie, at this moment, I am saved. Now, if you believe it here in the studio, give God a mighty shout so they hear you all the way there at your house. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to do something before I teach. I want you to pick up the phone and dial the number that's on the screen and tell our Love World prayer partners Tell Pastor Chris, tell Pastor Benny, I just gave my life to Jesus Christ. Watching this program, I want you to do it right now. I'll, you can come right back. I'm going to teach. I won't be too deep into it. But I want you to pick up the phone right now. If you just gave your life to Christ, we want to know because we want to pray with you and pray for you because this is the first day of the launching of your life. And man, it's going to be glorious. Amen. Praise God. Well, I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 35. Thank you, Love World singers and musicians. Psalms 35, verse 27. I want to give honor to the men and women of God behind me here. All of us have been introduced to you moments ago, and I want to thank our dear man of God, Pastor Chris and Pastor Benny. And yesterday, as I was preaching with Dr. John Avanzini, we did not discuss what we were going to teach or talk about. And I, I, I was in the middle of teaching and preaching yesterday, and the Holy Spirit, right in the middle of my message, about 75% of the way through, he shifted me and said, talk about the debt-free home and do it now. So I immediately shifted into that. Then we introduced Dr. John Avanzini, who came to the pulpit, and first thing he said was, that's exactly what the Lord told me to preach about. And he made the statement while he was, he said, I prayed sitting back on the couch, Lord, Dr. Mike just stole my message. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, no, it's both of your message. And then I thought, wow, I watched him as a young boy on TV. And here I am in Africa on the same platform preaching with this man of God that influenced me so much. So I loved on him and hugged on him and honored him. God's been so good. I've been around some amazing people in my life, and I'm so thankful to be here with Pastor Benny and Pastor Chris. Thank you both so much for the honor of being here, and Reverend Tom and everyone on the platform. Pastor Osei, she and I usually preach together in Houston, Texas, don't we? There's an old saying in Texas, never ask a man where he's from. If he's from Texas, he'll tell you immediately, and if he's not, don't embarrass him. That's an old expression. You guys in Chicago will know. I'm going to change that to Lagos. Don't ever ask a man from Lagos where he's from. Because if he's from Nigeria, he'll tell you, and if not, don't embarrass him. This is a glorious place, amen? 
Psalms 35 verse 27 says, let the Lord be magnified who has what? Pleasure, everybody say pleasure, in the prosperity of his servants. I want you to look at it again. Let's read the whole verse together. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yes, let them say continually. Let them what? Say continually. Why did God tell you to say it continually? Because your flesh will talk you out of that belief system if you don't. You'll begin to buy the religious lie. God wants you poor. God wants you humble. God wants you to have lack. God wants you not to have too much. A woman said to me one day, she was a waitress. She had two small kids, single mom. And she said, I have enough money to pay my rent and I don't want any more than that. Because she said, if you get too much money, everybody knows you backslide. If you have too much blessing, you'll walk away from God. I said, do you really believe that? She said, yes. I said, would you mind if I called your boss over right now? She said, well, that makes me nervous. Are you unhappy with my service? I said, no, no, I just want to help you out. If you really believe money makes you backslide, I'm going to ask him to cut your salary in half to ensure you always serve Jesus. And she didn't want me to do that. If money makes you backslide, Satan would have doubled Job's salary instead of taking everything that he had. See, money is a tree. Money's now even digital. started off as coins, then it became you cut a tree down, made paper out of it, put dead people's pictures on it, dyed it green, red, different colors, put it in your pocket. How's that supposed to rise up out of your purse and make you hate God? It's really crazy when you think about it. If somebody said, we have a couch we don't need anymore, we'd like to give it to you. Oh, I have too many couches. And everybody knows if you have too many couches, you'll hate the Lord. People think you're crazy. But I hear people say it all the time. Too much money makes you backslide. Too much money makes you walk away from God. Why would that be, Reverend Tom? It's a religious thought. The Bible said, "Let the put it up again for me. Let the Lord be magnified. What? Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure. Who does? The Lord. In the prosperity of his servants. So it's God's will that you prosper. Now, religious folks will come in and say, well, that just means prosper in your spirit. No, it means prosper. And the Bible says in 3 John, beloved, I wish above all things that you may what? Prosper and be in hell, even as your soul prospers. So it's all through the scripture that God wants us to prosper. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's more blessed to what? Give than receive. So giving is in the nature of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. He's a giving God. Satan steals, I learned this from my mentor, Satan steals, man hoards, God is a giver. One of those three is going to describe you and I. I want to be a giver, I want to, be a, I want to live in the rhythm of generosity, the rhythm of sowing. So there's three things that we could call it three gifts if you want to from a Savior who loves you. I like to call it three parts of your inheritance that God has gifted to you. I want you to write them down. Number one is the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. You say, Mike, how's that a gift? What, what, what about that? Well, that's what I've talked about before. I say this probably in every church that I preach in every week. I'm on a plane somewhere. Christians don't have a forgiven past because they have no past at all because of righteousness. Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 10 says, when we believed in Christ and trusted in him, our sins were remitted, which means erased, deleted. It's one thing to be forgiven. It's another thing to have it erased. So like in the United States, we have a saying, if you go to jail, you get arrested, and you serve your time. When you get out, they say you still have a, you know this from Chicago, Brother Dan, if you go to jail for two years and you get out, you've done your time, but you still have a, you got a record. You know this. You have a record. <laughs> Why do you know this? I'm, I'll talk to you about that later. You have a record, Pastor Ose. It doesn't matter. You could, you could cure cancer, dementia, AIDS, find a cure for world hunger, and you'd still have a record. You could go 50 years and have good deeds and get pulled over for one speeding ticket and the police officer reads your driver's license, keys you in the system. Ah, you got a past. You can't go back to jail for it, but it's there. You have a record. Now imagine if you went back to court, you got out of jail, and the judge said to the court reporter, bring up their, their information on the screen. And there's all the information, all the stuff in the newspaper the day you were arrested, all of your trial notes, all of your jail time all of your attorney's conversations. Now he said to the court reporter, highlight all of it and hit the delete button. I don't even want it to appear in the records ever. That's remittance. And that's what the Bible says happened the moment you got born again. Your past was erased. It's one thing to be forgiven, but it's still back there. It's another thing to have it completely erased. And that's the gift of righteousness. Man, that's a freeing thing. When I was a boy, about 13, 
A Sunday school teacher pulled me off to the side and he said, you know, sin can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And I said, I heard that. He said, that means if you sin and you don't have a chance to confess it and you get hit by a bus or the rapture happens, you're going to be lost. And I, I thought, oh, he must know what he's talking about because he's an older man. And it really scared me. I thought, oh, uh, I was 14. I was just, you know, hitting puberty. I was becoming sexually aware. I had bad thoughts. I just, I was a kid. And I thought, wow, well, what, if, what if I can't confess fast enough? I don't want to go to hell. And I literally believed that. I didn't know about the righteousness of God. You see, you can get more wisdom as a Christian. You can grow your faith. You can grow in patience. You can grow in love. But you can never be more righteous than you are the moment you get born. You can't add to the righteousness of God. How could you add and make Jesus more righteous? Because it's never been your righteousness. It's the righteousness of God in Christ. So you get the gift of righteousness as a massive inheritance. The moment you're born again, you're righteous. I like to tell this story because I love motorcycles. I ride motorcycles a lot to relax. And there was a, there was a biker gang near my town. It was all made up of women. Now, these are some mean girls. They rode Harley Davidsons and they carried switchblades and they were not the kind of women you'd bring home to mom. I mean, they were mean women. And one of them, Yvonne, was kind of the leader. Really tall, probably weighed 300 pounds. She was a big old gal and she was mean. Man, everybody knew. She worked at the truck stop down by my house when I was in my 20s and you knew not to fool with Yvonne. But Yvonne got born again, heard about Jesus, got saved, and I mean radically changed. She was so full of joy, and she was witnessing to everybody at the truck stop whether they wanted to talk about Jesus or not. Yvonne carried that, you know, that, that boldness over into her, her life, Love World Singers, and I can tell you, if she could come here, she could sing with all of you. She was great, but she smoked cigarettes. She had smoked them all her life, and she wanted to quit now that she would got born again. And I didn't know how much she smoked, but I know she smoked a lot because you could smell Yvonne before you saw her. I mean, it was bad. So one day she came up to me real happy. She says, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, oh, God's done a work in my life. She said, I'm, I'm down to just three packs of cigarettes a day. I'm down. I said, oh, well, down. Okay. Now the Bible says, Reverend Tom, to rejoice with those who rejoice. So I was happy with her, man. I, I was shouting with her, but I had to know. So after she finished shouting and after I finished rejoicing with her, I said, Yvonne, if you don't mind me asking, I really got to know, if you're down to three packs a day, what was you starting off with? And she said, Pastor Mike, I was at five packs a day. And I said, well, you just doubled your annual income going down to three with all the savings on the cigarette. But somebody was standing behind me, and they overheard the conversation. And they pulled me off to the side later and said, why didn't you rebuke her? Because she still smoked three packs of cigarettes. Why didn't you tell her she was going to hell? And I said, because she's not. See, the wild thing about the righteousness of Jesus is that her spirit, man, was made righteous in Christ. And she wasn't going to be any more righteous when she got down to one pack and no packs as she was when she was struggling with three. See, she didn't want to be there. She'd already gone down from five to four to three, and she was on her way to two and on her way to one, and she was doing everything she knew to do. And I'd never smoked a day in my life, so I, I didn't know how hard that was or if that was bad. Bishop Payne, you smoked a few cigarettes before you got born again. I'm told that's pretty rough. I was rejoicing with this baby Christian because in her heart I knew she was doing everything she knew to do to get off of us. We just prayed to get her delivered. But the religious folks wanted me to rebuke her. Man said to me one day, said, Mike, let me ask you a question. Said, if a man is, is, is a Christian and he's at his job and he gets real stressed, we, one day he gets so stressed he goes straight to a bar and he gets drunk. And on the way home he gets hit by a car and dies instantly while he's still drunk. Does he go to heaven or does he go to hell? And I knew what he was trying to say. He's trying to, you know, do that religious thing. I said, let me ask you a different question. Let's make it all about you. Two times in the New Testament, the Bible says obey the laws of the land. So the speed limit in the United States is usually 55 miles an hour. I said, let's make the story about you. You're at work. You've had a stressful day. You're racing home from work going 56 and a 55, and you have a heart attack and die. Where do you go? And he didn't want to answer the question. See, the gift of righteousness is that it's not a better you. It's he exchanges your imperfect record with the righteousness of Jesus. And the moment you get born again, you become the righteousness of God in Christ. Come on, somebody, give God a shout in this place. We're talking about 
the righteousness of Jesus. I never get tired of saying it. Christians don't have a forgiven past. We have no past at all. And to get to grow closer and closer and closer to this God. And getting close to Jesus is what it's all about. That's what praise a all about. It's encouraging all of us to get closer to him and to get the message out so others can get close as well. I was thinking here today, listen to Love World Singers. Pastor, Reverend Tom, you said it right. The theology in the songs. I said it yesterday and I meant it. I really grieve when I travel in different churches, pastored by good people. But the praise and worship lyrics come up, and I think that line's not in the Bible. That line's not scriptural. I can't say that one. You can't sing half of the songs because they're not scriptural. But when I come here, you never have that problem. You can sing everything with confidence and boldness. But I was listening to Love World Singers a moment ago, and you there at your house were listening to us, and I know you could sense the presence of the Lord, and you were so caught up in that as well. And I remember when I was about 24, I was in New Zealand. And I was in a pastor's home, sleeping in his basement, and they'd all left for a few hours, and I didn't have anything to do, and I loved to read, and I, I was going through the pastor's library, and I found a book by Jack Hayford on prayer. And I got it out and began to read it, and Jack Hayford told the story of how when he got older, he was waking up a lot at night, and he was just being honest in the book. He said, I didn't know, am I, am I being woke up because I have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night more, just getting older, or is God waking me up? So he said to the Lord one day, Lord, I don't ever want to miss you. If you're waking me up in the night, I don't want to miss it, but I don't want to stay up if I don't have to. So he gave God a time in the middle of the night, like some weird time, like 1.52. And he said, if I ever wake up at that time, I'll know it's you. And he said, the very next night, he woke up at that time. Felt led to intercede for Los Angeles. Didn't know why, prayed, then went back to bed, and the next day, the L.A. riots broke out that made big news for decades, and you can Google it and read all about it. Well, as a young kid, I was laying on the floor on my stomach reading this book, and boy, that hit me. I thought, oh, you think God would do that for me? If God would wake me up in the night, Reverend Tom, at like a specific time, I was craving a burning bush experience of my own that might remove any doubt that I ever had. I, I loved God. I was, I'd been preaching for over 10 years at that point, and I just said, Lord, I'm not older. I don't ever wake up in the middle of the night for any reason. Once I go to bed, I'm out. But if you could do that for me, and I gave God a time, but I made it hard. I didn't want 3, 4, 5, or 2.30 or 3.30, something that might be, you know, easy that I would later think, well, my body clock did that or whatever. So I gave God an odd time. I never tell it publicly, but think like, you know, 4.08 or something like that. Went to bed, kind of half forgot about it. Was laying on my back asleep, Pastor Dan, middle of the night, and instantly was awakened by what felt like an invisible hand popping me on the chest just like that. I told you this last year. I just lay in there. And I, was, I was instantly, instantly wide awake as I am right now. I felt it just like that on my chest. And I woke up. And I had forgot about what I had just done. So I'm laying there thinking, why am I awake? What just hit my chest? I looked around the room. It was pitch dark, no windows. I couldn't see anything. No cell phones back in that day. So there was no way to get light. So I had my wristwatch on the nightstand. So I grabbed it, got out of bed, because it had hit me. Wait, 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 wait. What if? What if? This is what I prayed about earlier. What if? I just felt this pop. And I felt like I wasn't alone in the room. I didn't know how to describe it. I, I quickly got up, grabbed my wristwatch, walked five feet over to the light switch, flipped it on. And to the second, it was the time I had asked God to wake me up. And in that moment, I felt like a bucket of warm honey hit my head and flowed down on me. And my knees literally buckled and I, I grabbed the wall, and all that would come out of my mouth was the phrase over and over again, you're so holy, you're so holy, you're so holy, you're so holy, you're so holy. And I can promise you from that day till now, hundreds and hundreds of times, God has awakened me at that time. One time I was going through a particular trial, really struggling with some things, attacked on every side, and my children said, Daddy, would you take us to a carnival? where there's all kind of games, pinball machines, and they all have score uh, scoreboards at the top of them. They're all digital. They tell you how many points you won. There's like 30 of them all over this one room, and they're not plugged up. They're not the same game. They're all different games. This is where you got to catch this, Pastor Dan. This is the middle of the daytime. It's not the nighttime when God wakes me up. But I walked in with a heavy heart, wasn't telling anybody about the attacks and the things I was facing at the moment. And my kids ran in front of me because they were excited to play all these games. And when I got to the door and I opened it, every scoreboard in that business 
popped to the digital time, God wakes me up at. Every single one of them. Not connected. No matter who was playing them, their score, building wide, became my time. And I felt that same. I said, this God is surely with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because he's right in here. And he imparted to us the inheritance called righteousness. So everywhere you go, I know who I am. It's not about your performance. We do want to do right. We do want to be holy. We do want to act right. But boy, even when you don't, your condition and your position are not the same thing. He's given us the gift of righteousness. Somebody give him a big thank you, Jesus, right now. Number two, he gave us the gift of, our na- of his name. One of your inheritances is the gift of his name. He gave you the ability to use his name, the name of Jesus. It's not just a tr- religious way of how we end our prayers. It's not just a way that we, we sound you know, super uh, religious or this is the protocol. He gave us the authority to use his name as if it were him himself using it. The phrase in the name of Jesus isn't just how you end a prayer to be polite. It literally means in the place of. Father, I ask you for X, Y, Z, in the place of Jesus. He gave you, James Payne, the right to use his name. So at the name of Jesus, sickness goes, disease goes, demons go. And he gave you and I the privilege of speaking that name. I remember being in Kenya years ago. I was on a platform about 10 feet tall outside preaching an outdoor crusade. And I was closing the message. And they brought a girl in on a a stretcher and brought her right to the front of the speakers. Laid her down. She's all passed out. I'm preaching. I'm going on about my my, my ministry. I'm, I'm about to make the altar call. And something inside of me prompted me and said, go down and pray for her. Well, I'm 10. I'm on a platform. I'm way up. There's no ladder. I got to jump down. But she's down there on the ground. And so I looked at my interpreter and I said, lead the people in a song. I jumped off the platform, went down to look at her. And the long story short, she was dead. No pulse, no heartbeat, no breathing. By the time I got down to her, she'd been on the floor down there for 20 minutes. My team had been gathered around her praying. They knew about more of the details than I did at that moment. But I jumped off the platform. And I'm about to lead the crowd to Christ, so I can't stay down there long, but I felt stirred to do it. Never have jumped off the platform before or since, but I jumped down. And I walked over to her, and I put my hand on her shoulder. Checked her for breathing, checked her pulse, checked her heart. They'd already done the same. She'd been dead for 20 minutes at least. Somebody asked me one day, Mike, you're not a medical doctor. How do you know she was dead? Well, where I come from in Texas... If you don't breathe, have a heartbeat or a pulse for 20 minutes, you're dead. I'm pretty sure that's dead anywhere in the world. I was right in front of the speakers. They were 10 feet high. They were blaring. You you couldn't hear anything coming out of your own mouth. But I put my hand on her shoulder, and a force I didn't premeditate, I feel, came out of me like like a water. Jesus said, out of your innermost being flows the river. And, And I shouted as loud as I could, live! In Jesus' name. And I felt instantly prompted to leave her. So I turned and climbed back up, got on the platform, began to pray for the people, and I led them to Christ. And we're 10 minutes down. I have forgot about all the things down here. And my interpreter pulled my coat, and he said, my God, Mike, look. Look in the middle of the crowd. So I did, just a whole sea of people. I said, I don't see what you're talking about. So I just kept praying for the people to get saved. He said, no, Mike, don't you get it? Look in the middle of the crowd. Look at the girl. I looked out there, there's a, there's a thousand girls. I, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, no, Mike, the girl. And he pointed to the empty stretcher. And the girl that we had just prayed for was standing in the middle of the crowd looking right at me. Come on, somebody, give God some shout. Before we could get to her, they took her away. They, they took her home because she was a little woozy. But my team went to her house, found out where she lived, led her to Christ, The next night, she testified on our crusade platform. I was the dead girl last night that Jesus raised from the dead. I'm taught, all we said was live in Jesus' name. But that's all we had to say. He's given you and I the name. You can say it over disease. You can say it over sickness. You can say it over the dead. You can say it over a situation. You can say it over your finances. You can't just think of it as a good name. You have to use the name. 
It's been given to you as a gift. You get to lay hands on the sick. You get to rebuke the devil. Oh, one of our crusades in Ghana. Two girls came in, 14. Uh, cousins. One girl began to throw up in the middle of the sermon just and make a scene, so they escorted her out to the first aid tent. My crusade director walked her over, and one girl sat down on the couch, and the other girl immediately began to throw up and lay down on the floor, got stiff as a board, and levitated five feet in the air. And the demons dropped her back down and raised her up and dropped her. She was popping up and down like a sewing machine needle. And a man's voice came out of the other girl that said, we told them not to come to this meeting, but they wouldn't listen to us. So we made her sick so they couldn't hear the message. Well, that'd make a lot of religious people say, okay, well, we're going over here. Y'all just going home. But all that was said to her was, you lying, stupid demon. We cast you out now in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And in 15 seconds, she was sitting up, born again, praying in tongues. So was the girl on the couch. They came back in. Oh, come on, somebody. They came back into the meeting and testified. Why? Because somebody was really a good person? No. We used the name of Jesus. Dr. Avanzini talked about it last night. You can speak to your bills. He said he and Pat used to talk to their bills. You're being paid off. You're out of my life. They talked one debt out using their mouth and closing their declaration in the name of Jesus. The gift of righteousness is an inheritance. The ability to use his name. Some of you are talking so much about poverty. My spiritual dad taught me years ago the number one reason that people stay poor is resentment of the rich. Because you can't learn from anybody that you resent. You look at a housekeeper who has served a billionaire family for 20 years and still is in poverty herself. You can't learn from people you secretly resent. And when you make people your source, you get resentful of people who are more blessed than you. But if you realize God is your source, you have no limits. Number one is righteousness. Number two is the gift of his name. Number three is the gift of faith to believe for your harvest. The gift of faith to believe for your harvest. Everybody say, my harvest. See, God's got a harvest for you. This is what we're teaching on all week here at Love World. God had a son, but he wanted a family. So he planted Jesus to give birth to his family, and here we are. Even God sows seed. So as God began to show me years ago the power of sowing a seed. But as I taught last night, giving in and of itself, and please hear this at your house, giving in and of itself does not overly impress God because everything he created automatically has to give. See, whether you want to or not, you're always giving off a bad attitude or a good attitude. You're giving off a cheerful heart or a grudging heart. The sun can't say to God, I don't want to give heat anymore. We're kind of tired of that. The ocean can't tell God we're tired of giving life to the fish. They're out of here. The chicken can't tell God I'm not laying eggs anymore. See, atheists, child molesters, rapists, even have people they're good to. Everything on the earth gives. You go to Hindu countries and they're burning incense to pagan gods. Buddhists are giving up meals 40 and 50 days in a row. Everything God made gives. Even demons give shame, guilt, temptation, a hard time, harassment, oppression. Everything God made gives. So the giving is not what? <coughs> Pardon me. Giving is not in and of itself what impresses God. It's our faith that we wrap around the gift. Knowing when I take something that I can see, which is my offering, and I give it to a God I cannot see, but I wrap my faith around it, God gets in covenant with it and gives it back to me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God gives me a harvest when I use my faith to call it in. And that's what we have to do. Every time you sow a seed, you wrap your faith around. Every time you plant a seed, you wrap faith around. Every time you give an offering. You don't say stupid religious stuff like, I give expecting nothing in return. Who do we think we are? You get to dictate to God he can't be a good father. You'll give to him. He can't give back to you. Are you kidding? He said it's more blessed to give than receive, so I can't tell God he has to be robbed of the joy of giving to me because I'm the only one who's allowed to give. It's true. Listen, when you say things like that, I'm giving, expecting nothing in return, you're going to get exactly that. You're going to get nothing in return. And Satan will control your present seed and your harvest because your mouth can negate your offering. 
For your mouth can propel your offering. Over and over again through my life, God started me off with a $500 seed, then a $1,000 seed, then a $2,000 seed, then a $3,500 seed, then $5,000 and ten. And it just climbed up, 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 up. But each level was a new faith. Not to give it, because I had it. You can't give what you don't have. I've got a motorcycle, so I can give it. I don't own a boat, so I can't give a boat away. But I can give what I have in my hand. And so the faith part's not the giving. The faith part is believing God's going to get in covenant with it and send it back to me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. That's the faith part. And the good news is he's already given you the faith to believe for that. He's given every man the measure of faith. He's done it for all of us. I remember years ago there was a man, and I'll close with this. He'd heard me talk about the power of the seed. He'd heard me talk about how you can sow a seed, wrap your faith around it, and call back in your harvest. He'd heard me teach on Luke 6, 38, give. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Those are the words of Jesus. He heard about Mark chapter 10, verse 28 through 30, that if I sow anything, I'll get it back in this lifetime 100-fold. And his wife had just died of cancer and left him with $70,000 in unpaid medical bills. Everybody's saying in the studio, 70000 That was after insurance had paid their part. He said, Mike, it's going to bankrupt me. I, I don't have $70,000. And here's the cool part, Brother Payne. He, I asked him this on purpose. He had been to the hospital five times asking them to negotiate a payout deal. Five times the hospital said no deal. Five times we're not going to cut your deal. We're not going to give you a break. No, five times you got nothing. So he said, Mike, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I heard you talk about the power of a seed today. He said, here's what my monthly payment is on my, my hospital. It's like 700 bucks a month. He said, do you think if I paid, if I took something like the $700 I give every month to the hospital, if I took that and gave it to God, wrapping my faith around it for debt cancellation, do you think God could get me out of this? And Reverend Tom, as they sowed that seed, as he was talking to me about it, he was shaking. This guy's crying. He's an associate pastor at a church. Wife just died. He's grieving that. He's got $70,000 in hospital bills. And he says, do you think if I sowed a seed, God would give me a debt free? You think God would wipe that out? You think God would wrap faith? You think that would happen? I said, I know it would. Thank you so much. And so I said, I think if you'll just take me by the hand, you're going to be shocked at what God does. And I said, remember when the harvest comes, you went five times to them asking for help. And five times they told you no. You've gone to that hospital five times and said, I don't have any money. Would you work a deal with me? And five times they told you to get out. So I want you to see what your God will do as we wrap faith around this seed. So he wrote a check out for $700 to his, to, to his church. The offering wasn't for us. I took him by the hand and prayed a prayer like I'm about to pray for you. And I said, Father, this is how the Lord led me. Shock him with how fast his seed will multiply for a harvest. Because the Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. 72 hours later, his pastor called me. They were shouting. They were going nuts. And they said, we just got a call, Mike, from the hospital. We don't know what's going on. But they said they had reviewed our $70,000 bill. And every once in a while, they like to do something nice for people. And they've decided to mark my entire bill of $70,000 paid in full. And in three days, they wiped the whole bill off from the power of a seed that he sowed in faith. I want our love world musicians to come because this is what I'm talking about. That he's given you, he's given me the gift of righteousness. He's given us the gift of his name. And he's given us the faith to sow a seed and wrap faith around it. And call that thing in for a harvest. I had a pastor sitting in front of me one day. He had a lot of debt to the IRS. He said, Mike, I owe, the, I owe, the, I owe tax debt, man. I got some serious tax debt. And he said, I didn't, know, I didn't sow in the offering when the offering plate passed, but I can't leave the building because I'm under conviction. He said, God, God's wanting me to sow when he told me what. And he said, I, it doesn't make any sense. Why should I get money now when I got so much debt to the IRS? They're going to come repossess everything I got, freeze my bank accounts. I said, just one reason, man. God never talks to you about a seed unless he's got a harvest on his mind. God's going to take your seed. If you'll obey today, we're going to wrap faith around it. We're going to call in the harvest. You see, you can sow all your life, but if you don't use your faith to call in your harvest, you've missed the whole equation. 
Oral Roberts said the secret to his ministry was sowing a seed for a targeted harvest. That's how he built the whole city of faith. So I took him by the hand, began to pray. Father, he's got IRS debt. He's got a seed. You've told him to sow a seed. He's here now. It's hard for him, Lord, but we're going to wrap faith together around it. If you did it for me, you'll do it for him. If you did it for the, for the associate pastor with the hospital and so many of you, do it for him too. Shock him with how fast you can be good to him. He sowed the seed. He's going home. Listen to this, Bishop Payne. He's going home and saw a for sale sign on a piece of property. And the Holy Spirit said, stop now and speak to the owner. Again, he's like, Lord, I, I got IRS debt. I just sowed a big seed. I, I can't be buying no property. But he walked over to a guy and he said, do you own this land? And the man began to cuss him out. Wasn't a Christian. He cussed him out and said, You've, what are you doing on my property? So I saw you had a for sale sign. He said, I'm going through a bad divorce. If I don't sell this land today, there's going to be a lot of consequences. And the Holy Spirit told him something crazy. Offer him $1,000 for the, the big acreage, big acreage. And he had no idea what he would even do with it. Now he's down to $1,000 left. But he knew God was up to something. So he used his faith and said, Lord, okay. He told the man, you got it. And, and wrote him out a check right then. Bought the property. Five days later, he found out the YMCA, which is a group in America that has kids sports. They play football and soccer every Saturday. They were looking for a new piece of property to have their games on. And the long story short is they heard about this guy. They said, we've been looking for the owner of this property and never could find him. He said, well, I found him so easy the other day, but I own it now. And they said, we've got to have it. What would you give us for it? What could we give you for it? And he had no idea what it was even worth because he just owned it for a short time. Long story short, they wrote him a check that day for $18,000. Paid off all his IRS debt. He bought it for $1,000, sold it that week for $18,000, got his harvest back. Come on, you're not shouting enough on this testimony. God gave this man... Because of his faith. Because of his faith. I want to pray for you right now. And then you're going to go to the phone. And I about half preached my voice out yesterday, I think, as you can tell. But God has helped me to deliver this word to you. Because he has a harvest on the other end of your seed. So many times God uses me in, in numbers. The number I feel today is not specific. But it's an uncommon seed for you for a debt that you're facing right now. I want you to go to the phone. Not yet, not until I finish my special prayer. The Love World singers are going to come. But he's given you the gift of righteousness. He's given you the gift of his name. He's given you faith. The Bible says God's given every man the measure of faith. So none of us don't have any. But you take the seed of what you've got. And you sow it. Some of you need to sow a $1,000 seed. Some of you, God's blessed at a different level. And you've got major needs. Some of you are facing a court battle. Maybe even with the government, with your taxes. You're going to sow a $10,000 seed. I've been praying all week for five people who will plant a $100,000 seed. And I've asked God for million-dollar seeds this week as well. And his sheep know his voice, and another they will not follow. I'm going to ask you to go to the phone. Some of you may feel stirred about a $500 seed or even a $120 seed. But it's something specific to something you're facing or something you're wanting to start, something you're wanting to launch. And God's going to ask you to plant this seed in faith like the people I talked about. Some of you may have your back up against the wall like they did. It may be a critical point. Lord, not now, not now, please not now. But his sheep know his voice, and God never talks to us about a seed in our hand unless he's looking at what's in his, and he just wants to make an exchange. Nothing leaves heaven till something leaves the earth. Father, in the name of Jesus, I've told your people what you've told me to say. I've held nothing back, Lord. I've spoken it, and they've received it. Father, I ask you for 300 miracles in the lives of 300 people today. The moment I finish my teaching, they're going to pick up the phone. The moment they reach for the phone, the first part of the harvest is going to be released from heaven toward their life. Lord, today, some of us are sowing $10,000. Some of us are sowing $1,000. Some of us are sowing $500. Your sheep know your voice. They already know the amount, even in the audience, even in the studio. We already know what we're supposed to do because you've bore witness with our spirit. I wrap my faith with their faith around their seed today. And we present it to the God who gave us everything. And we're calling in our harvest. As the Love World singers prepare to sing, we're going to go to the phone. As we go into a song, we're going to go into our sowing. And we're going to call our harvest back. And I ask you for the greatest waves of testimonies that the Love World Partnership family has ever had from this seed of obedience. In Jesus' precious name. 
It is done. Now, as the Love World singers come, I want you to grab your phone right now. Come on. This is not the moment to think about it or pray about it. Pick up your phone right now. Dial the number that's on the screen. Watch what God will do for you. God bless you, Love World singers.
My, 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 praise my, love Lord. world singers, you got me shouting and praising God. God and worshiping Him for His goodness and His mercy. I just hear that anthem. We worship you. You are holy. Come on. You are mighty. Yes. You are wonderful. Yes. One more time. So mighty. So you powerful. Holy. Yes. You are gracious. You are wonderful. You are so glorious. So powerful. And there is none like you. We worship you. Wherever you are, take 15 seconds right now and pray in the Holy Ghost. Riva sonda bashia te, ye God, ye God, ye God, yes Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you, yeah. we worship you. Glory to God. Don't change that song. Glory We're going to come right back to it. Let's, Glory let's, to God. Let's read it because the phones, people are calling. Yes, they are. Worshiping. Yes, they are. And we're going to come right back to it. I feel like marching Praise with God. that song. We worship you. Hallelujah. You are marching right into the phone center calling right now, including, oh my goodness, Sister Pam from Nigeria. $1,000. What have you got, Pastor Ose? It's Brother ba Barum from Australia, $1,500. Hallelujah. I have uh, Obi from Nigeria. I probably butchered that name. Obehi. Obehi. $1,000. Gabil. Gabil from Nigeria, $1,000. Hallelujah. Brother Lance from the UK, 1,000 euro. Here is Mrs. Merith from Ireland. 857 pounds. Hallelujah. Here's another Nigeria. $1,000. Here's pa a pastor. Pastor China from Nigeria. $1,000. And here's brother Robo from Nigeria. $1,000. I have Zimbabwe. $1,000. Hallelujah. Mrs. Anna. Thank you, Mrs. Anna. And I have Mr. Danny 
$1,000 from Nigeria. That's a good name. Yeah, I like and that. And Mrs. Choma, £635 from the UK. And I have South Africa. Deacon Patrick, $1,000. I got Zimbabwe. You do? Makada, Mr. Makada from Zimbabwe, $1,000. And I have Safi from the U.S., $300. There you go. I have Pastor Comfort. Oh, I like that name. Yeah. $1,000. How about this name? Hope. From the United Kingdom, uh, $752. And I have um, Angela from the U.S., 300 I tell you, Zimbabwe is really calling today. Yeah. Zimbabwe, Sister Abigail, thank you, $1,000. Here's Deidre from Australia, $784. Thank you. And here's Kashun from the United States, $220. And I have Brother Tendai? Tendai. Tendai, Tendai from Namibia, $1,000. Here's Esther from Tanzania, United Republic, $395. This is wonderful. Dan, this I'm is... going to the phones now to pray for people that Because are the calling. phones are ringing and ringing, yes. and we want you to call right now. Bishop Payne, while you're gone, we're going to sing that song again. Yeah. Okay, we worship you. Who? What, what do you have? This Pastor? is Nora from the United States, $200. I like this one. Sister Blessing from Nigeria, $1,000. Hallelujah. So this is, I tell you, we want you to get in on this. You know, Pastor Ose, I leaned over to Bishop Payne. Bishop Payne taught me, he's taught me so much. We've known each other for so many years. He taught me something some years ago. He said, doing praise a thought, doing what we're doing this week is not just about raising funds. Though indeed it is about raising funds for the kingdom and sowing into the kingdom of God and sowing into love world so the gospel can go around the world. Certainly we're here so that you can sow seed. But more importantly is the connection that we want to make with people when they call. This is, this is us stopping by the widow's house and we're able to make that connection with them. When you call, this is so about us partnering with you to pray with you to love on you pastor chris and pastor benny love you so so much and all of us here at your love world and this is our opportunity not just to you know raise funds we're not trying to raise budget this is a debt-free ministry but what we're doing is partnering with you so we can continue to take the gospel further and further and expand the outreach around the world and so we want you to know you're that important to us that probably we don't we wouldn't have to do this if it was just about raising funds but that's not our priority our priority is to minister the gospel to you and be able to connect to you and so we want you to call right now the numbers right there on your screen all of the information that you need and love world singers i want them to come back one more time and while you're calling i want to give you just a few more minutes and i want you to call and when we come back i promise you we're going to stir it up just a little bit i'm going to bring you a, a word from the lord but love world singers bring us right back to that we worship you you got me going on that one hallelujah yes we worship you
I think we could just call him all day long. We could go into Alpha Omega, beginning and the end, first and the last. We worship you, wonderful counselor, mighty God. We could just go on all day. We worship you. Beginning and the end. We worship you. First and last, that which is and which was to come. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. We worship you. Wonderful counsel of mighty God, everlasting Father. Yeah. We worship you. You're the love of That's what you're doing when you pick up the phone and you call right now. And you say, I'm standing with Pastor Chris and Pastor Benny for Love World doing this praise of thought. It is worship unto the Lord. I'm always reminded of Hezekiah, Bishop Payne. Hezekiah, when he needed a miracle, he reminded God that his seed was worship. Because he reminded, he said, that seed was worship. Your, I don't have time to preach about that today. But your seed is worship. Hallelujah. Pick up the phone and call right now. I see Dr. Smalley back there, Bishop Payne, uh, Reverend Tom, Pastor Kay, Evangelist Eddie. I see them all back there taking one phone call after the other. Don't miss this opportunity. That's it, Love World Band and Love World Singers. That seals the deal. I'm now going to be in the Love World Singers. Okay? I'm now a Love World Singer. <laughs> That's it, Pastor Jose. I'm not coming back to Houston. I'm moving to Lagos, and I'm going to be in the Love World Singers. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but for now, it feels really good. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about that. Well, I want you to know today we're so happy. Thank you, Love World Singers. We're so happy that you're here with us today. There, this week has just been overflowing, overflowing, with grace and overflowing with mercy and overflowing with the power and the love of God. And right now, I, I want to remind you what I said just a moment ago. Bishop Payne taught me many years ago, partnership is not about raising funds. Certainly, we want you to call and we want you to give so the gospel can go forward and you reap that harvest. But this is, we want to have that connection with you and be able to, 
to partner with you and pray with you and to have this opportunity and to be able to say, we worship you. Uh, don't stop me again. Don't stop me again. Don't stop. I'm trying to stop now. And if you do it one more time, you don't know. I'll be running around this studio. So you, 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 we got to sit down. Sit down, Love World Singers, because you'll have, you don't know. You don't know me. I'm from Chicago, and I, it'll take us half the day to stop me if we don't stop, stop right now. I love you so much, and there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you. And we love you, our Love World family. I tell you our greatest joy is to get to minister to you and thank you for every phone call that's coming in right now we truly truly love you well I tell you Bishop Payne uh, we got some we got some big shoulders to have to stand on after Dr. Mike Smalley preached that and taught that and pushed through uh, pushed through laryngitis that's what we do and he was pushing through it and just to be able to stand on his shoulders today and and minister to him brother sound man please keep me up here I don't want to be in that same condition so uh, we got some big shoulders to stand on but I want to minister just maybe how, how about Evangelist Eddie, could I just be a wild child from Chicago for about 20 minutes and minister? How about if I just took about 20 minutes? Then I'll just give Bishop Payne the rest of it. Could I do that? All right. So for the next 20 minutes, I want you to make sure you got your, got your good glue in your ponytail, okay, and everything's on nice and tight because let's just have some church for about 20 minutes here. I want to talk to you for about 20 minutes just now, before Bishop Payne comes, let me be the let me be the cream in the Oreo cookie. We'll start with Dr. Mike Smalley. I'll be the cream, and then Bishop Payne will be the closer. Okay. So let me just. I want to talk to you about a very familiar story, so you don't have to stress out about it. I want to read to you from John chapter eleven, and I want to give the media team a shout out here at Love World. People you will never see running cameras running sound, even when I'm telling them, give me everything, and they've got me perfect now. Running cameras, running sound, and pulling up scriptures on the screen. There are so many people working behind the scenes, and I want you to know we appreciate you, and we love you, and we thank God for you. Bless you. I want them to pull up John the 11th chapter. I feel that Holy Ghost familiar anointing on my life today as never before. From John chapter 11, I want to read you verses 1 through 6, and then I want to read you verses 19 through 21. And oh, this is a, this is a story I can remember from Sunday school as a kid. And, and I loved when they would dramatize it and act it out about Lazarus. But let me just take you there and then I want to talk to you about three friends that you need in your life to have longevity in ministry. To have longevity, don't cut my mic, to, to have longevity in ministry. Three friends that you need. Um, being a pastor for 47, my mic is coming and going, uh, being a pastor for 47 years does not mean that you have, that you know everything, but it does mean, uh, let's see if, it, I, I don't know if something's happening to my mic there or what, or if they they can get that back to where it was. Thank you. It's coming back in the name of Jesus. Come further. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Um, being a pastor in Chicago, 47 years, keep it coming, brother. Take it back to where it was. Bless your heart. Being a pastor 47 years does not mean that you know everything. But it means you've learned a few things. Can I just say that one more time since we were worried about the microphone? 47 years of being a pastor. Come on, brother. Bring it right. Bring it back. You had it where it was supposed to be a while ago. Being a pastor for 47 years does not mean that you know everything, but it means you've learned a few things along the line. And I've learned that there are three friends that you need to have longevity in ministry. Three friends that you need to have longevity in your ministry. From the book of John, the 11th chapter, if they get another mic that is working more properly, maybe get that microphone to me. But in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, the Bible says these words. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany. And from the town of Mary and her sister Martha. 
It was that Mary, let me read it off the screen in front of me. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. It was that Mary whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. You remember this. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Drop down to verse 19 through 21 in the same chapter of John chapter 11. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Verse 20, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Now look at verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. I tell you what, give me verse 22. Yes, but I know that, mm, Holy Ghost, Even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Keep that verse right there. But I know that even now, even now, I wish you would just slap that deadhead next to you and tell him, even now, even now, even now, even now. I I like titles of sermons that I don't have to try to remember for uh, for a long time. I like one one and two word titles. I preached unto you yet, and today I want to just talk to you about the three friends that you need. But I want to talk about the even now friend at the very end. So the third friend will be the even now friend. But let me give you some, some, some advice spiritually after being 47 years in ministry and and married to the same wife for 47 years and pastoring the same church for 47 years. Let me tell you, these three people that will help you sustain longevity in your ministry. The first one is that you have to have, I feel the Holy Ghost, the first one that you have to have is a mentor in your life. Kids, if you're writing it down, I'll just give you a few illustrations about a mentor, what it is and what it is not in your life. A mentor. We read about mentors all through the Bible. We read about, uh, we read about Elijah to Elisha. In fact, in 2 Kings chapter 2, we read that Elisha asked his mentor Elijah for a double portion. And Elijah's response is very telling, especially in the day and age that we live in. Because Elijah, the mentor to Elisha, Elijah said, all right, what you've asked is a hard thing, but If you see me when I go, in other words, if you stay till the end, anybody can start and anybody can stop. I've had a lot of so-called friends in my life or people who wanted to be mentored along life's way, but I don't even know where they are today. I I have no clue where they are. And oh, they told me how, how great I was and how they wanted to walk with me forever and they would never leave me or forsake me. They would be right beside me. I don't even know where they are. I don't know what state they live in because flesh is fickle. That's what my mother says. Flesh is fickle. It comes and it goes. But a mentor, I want to teach you this. Elijah said to Elisha, if you see me when I go, in other words, if you stick around, do you know, oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost here. Do you know that there is some harvest that come into your life simply because you stick around? There are some favor, some benefits that come into your life just because you stay in the place where you're supposed to be. If God has planted you, listen to me when I tell you, the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. The grass is not greener over there. That church is not better. That pastor is not better. That ministry is not better. Quit jumping around from place to place and church to church and pastor 
pastor to pastor. The grass is greener where you water it. Stay planted where God has planted you. Life is filled with ups and downs and all arounds and things transition and swiftly sometimes. But just stay planted. If you know how many times I thought, that's it, I'm, I'm getting out of ministry. I don't want to pastor a church in Chicago anymore. But by God's grace, he kept me doing what I was doing. And I really have felt like this. Oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost now, kids. I really, I, I think that there are blessings in my life. I mean, I'm standing here on the love world stage today. Surely this couldn't have possibly been for me. This surely was probably for somebody else. How could a punk kid from the south side of Chicago who had no genealogy, who had no name, who had nothing going, had an absentee father, had a mother with six kids she was trying to raise? How could a kid like me even be standing here? And I finally figured it out. I figured it was probably for somebody who was really fabulous and really great, somebody who was really amazing. But when the Lord went to pour out the blessing on them, when the Lord went to pour out the blessing, they were nowhere around. He couldn't find them. He didn't know where they were. And he looked over at 4501 West 127th Street in Alsop in Chicago. And he said, well, all right, I have this blessing, but I don't know where they are. They're running around trying to find the next best thing. But look who's still over there. Dan is still over there. So let me bless him some more. I've often felt like I don't know if this is the proper way to say it, but I've often felt like I have blessings in my life by default simply because when I didn't know how to preach good enough, when I didn't know how to sing good enough, when I didn't know how to do anything good enough, what I did know how to do was to stay planted, stable, steadfast. God is not as interested in your gifts as he is your stability, being a nail in a sure place. God has made everything adequate in my life that was inadequate. The things that I could not do, God increased them and God built them up because of one reason. I'm just a kid from the south side of Chicago. But because I made up my mind, there's one thing I can do. I can stand flat-footed and I can be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And by that, blessings and favor came in my life. But I had mentors along the way. Elijah had Elisha who stayed till the end. Stay where you are. Make up your mind. If she goes and he goes and they go and all y'all go, I'm going to still be standing right here. I'm going to be planted. I'm going to be do like a tree planted by rivers of living water. I mean, think about the fact that Naomi had Ruth. Ruth had a mentor named Naomi. If you recall what Ruth said, oh, God, I'm having fun preaching today, by the way, evangelist. Ruth said to Naomi, see, Naomi was her mentor. And you remember what Ruth said to Naomi? She said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God shall be my God. Ruth had a mentor that she wouldn't leave her side. Don't look for a mentor to get you to your next level. Look for a mentor that you can stand by for the rest of the days of your life. I've often said I'm going to write a book someday called The Second Man. Everybody wants to be the first man. But what God is looking for is somebody who can be the second man. Who can stand next to Pastor Chris? Reverend Tom, thank you for all these years of being the second man and standing next to Pastor Chris. Everybody doesn't understand that role. When I'm with Pastor Benny, can I teach this? When I'm traveling with Pastor Benny, I always realize this is not my thing. This is Pastor Benny's. I'm here to serve. I'm here at the good uh, to serve Pastor Chris on this week. I always am cognizant of the fact that whoever is the person that God has raised up don't you ever be an Absalom and try to compete with them you stand by their side all the days of your life people come and people go but a mentor is somebody you stand beside all the days of your life Paul had Timothy 
Naomi had Ruth. Elijah had Elisha. And can I tell you this? Because I've, I've only got about 20 minutes. And I want to talk about the mentor just one more moment here. You don't eat. Oh, God. I, this is pastoral teaching. Would it be okay to say this right here? Um, many people think a mentor is somebody they have to be up close and personal to. You have to make a decision. Do you want a mentor or do you want a best friend? Many people confuse being a best friend with a mentor. I'll make it plain for you. A couple of months ago, I was, I'm, I travel with Pastor Benny constantly. I don't even know where we were. We were somewhere. And some, Pastor Benny was long gone, okay? I'm still standing on the stage singing and leading and worship. And Pastor Benny was gone. He had finished ministering for two or three hours. He was gone. And somebody came rushing the stage with an envelope. And they said, wait, he can't leave. I've got, can I have, can I just borrow this for, let me, he said, I've got this seed for, for Pastor Benny. God told him he's going to, God told me Pastor Benny is going to be my mentor. And I've got a seed I want to sow into my mentor. And I stopped him and I said, that's wonderful. That's wonderful that you have a seed that you want to sow. But my brother, Pastor Benny is probably already at the hotel. He's not coming back for that. But if you'd like to, I'll take it and I'll give it to Pastor Benny for you and tell him that you want him to mentor you. He became irate. He took the seed back. He said, how dare you? If he's my mentor, that means I have to have a relationship with him. I'll put it in his hand. I'll, I need him to meet me tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and go to... I said, my brother, have a nice day. You ain't mean best to have been here at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'll tell you that right now. Because what he was looking for was a best friend and not a mentor. You have to make sure that a mentor, oh God, a mentor is not somebody you have to be up close and personal with. I've heard Pastor Benny say this, Dr. Mike, for years and years. Pastor Benny has said Catherine Kuhlman was one of his mentors, but he never even met her personally. A mentor is somebody you do not have to have a relationship. You can learn from them. That's why Pastor Chris is on television. You're not going to, you're not called to have a best friend relationship with Pastor Chris and you may never even meet him. You don't even have to be part of the conversation. You could learn a lot just by listening. If Pastor Chris is your mentor, you may never shake his hand. You may never meet him. You may never encounter him in this world, but he can be your mentor to help you sustain longevity. And stand by him. Every time we have a praise of thon, call, plant seed, say, that's my mentor. If I never get to go to breakfast at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning with him, he's my mentor. Number two, Bishop Payne, get ready, because I'm going to be done in 15 minutes. I feel the Holy Ghost pushing me, though. It could be 16 minutes, because I'm feeling a little something here right now. Uh, the second thing, so what's the first one you have to have? A mentor. I wish you'd holler at your boy. What's the first one you have to have? A mentor. Here's number two. If you're writing it down, write it with a pen, pen, uh, pencil, uh, get your mac mascara, whatever you need to write with, and write down the second person you have to have for longevity in ministry is a peacemaker. Somebody who's a peacemaker. Matthew 5 and 9. The Bible said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And the only point I'm going to give you about longevity with a peacemaker is this. Watch this. Listen to me, Felicia. Don't miss this. A peacemaker is never high maintenance. People who are high maintenance in your life are not peacemakers. We've all got people in our life that are high maintenance. Y'all y'all got any? I love you all so much. Y'all got you ever had anybody in your life that was high maintenance? They were high maintenance and low value. 
They required your time, your energy. Every time you called them after not talking to them for two months, they had to say, why you ain't called me? I ain't heard from you. How, who you talking to? How come? I love to have friends in my life. Bishop Payne, we haven't seen each other for 18 months. We've both been so busy. And when we saw each other, we didn't have to gangster each other and talk about where you been? How you supposed to be my friend? I haven't seen you for 18 months. We haven't talked. What? As soon as we saw each other, we embraced. Oh, it's so good. To, we pick up where we left off. That's a peacemaker in your life. Blessed are the peacemakers. Can I just preach today and tell you, if everybody in your life is the Felicia's telling you, talking about, hold my earrings, girl. Take my shoe. I'm going after her right now. Don't have people in your life who incite you to panic. People who incite you to rebellion. People who incite you to anger. Have people in your life that are steady like this who are a peacemaker. I have 47 years in ministry. doesn't mean you know everything, but it means you've learned a few things. And I've learned that you need a mentor. And it can be somebody from afar. I have watched Pastor Chris from afar. I'm in Chicago and he's in Lagos, Nigeria. But as God is my witness, he has been a mentor to me and thousands around the world. And we don't get to rub shoulders with him. And I don't get to eat jollof rice with him every day. But he is a mentor. Mentor, a mentor, you're not up close and personal. You watch their life. You listen to what they say. You stand by, by their side. And that's a mentor. A peacemaker is somebody who incites you to calm down, girl. Put your wig back on. Keep your ponytail in. Don't take your shoe off and throw it at them. A peacemaker is... My best friend, we've been best friends for so many years. You know why we're best friends? Because he don't talk. I do all the talking. You could sit with him all day long. And if you ask him a question, he'll say yes, no. But every Wednesday morning at 6 o'clock, He's going to give his tithe to the Lord online. Every week, he's going to sow seed into my life. Every week, no matter what I need, he would be, right? It's not about conversation. It's about being able to be the person in somebody's life who brings them that level of peace in their life. I don't need somebody who talks. I do talk and talk and talk. In fact, when I'm preaching most of the time, my wife is sitting on the front row. Pastor Ose, would you like to see my wife's expression? Get the camera on me. When I'm preaching, especially about Luigi, because my wife called me yesterday and said, why don't you let Luigi go? It was 47 years ago. Could you just let Luigi go? So this is my wife's expression most Sundays when I'm preaching. My heavens, the reason we've been able to be together is because she doesn't compete with me. She's not controlling. She's not Jezebel. She is a peacemaker. Run from people in your life who are not a peacemaker. Number three, I'm through. Are you, are you almost ready, Bishop Payne? Because I'm going to give the third one. First, a mentor. You've been a mentor in my life. You've taught me so much about television. I'm so sorry I failed everything. Look at me, I'm a hot mess running around sweating, acting crazy on stage. Everything you, you probably tried to get me not to do. But you've been one of the greatest mentors in my entire life. Thank you, Bishop Payne. And then the peacemakers. The peacemakers. Where would I be without the peacemakers? But here's the third one. You've got to have the even now friend in your life. Lazarus dies. Jesus comes. And Martha, you know, you got to give it to Martha. Reverend Tom, everybody's got a family. Well, I don't know. You're so peaceful. You probably don't have anybody in your family like this. But I got some folks in my family, they just got to say it. If they're thinking it, they just got to say it. And they're so proud of it. They're like, I just say everything I'm thinking. I always, whatever's in me, I just let it come out. That's not something to be proud of. That ought to be something that you, you need to learn how to deal with that situation. But I got family members, I just say whatever I want to say. Nobody can tell me anything. That's why they're broke. That's why they're disgusted. That's why they don't have relationships that's why they're in poverty because they never learn how to I, I don't know 
this might not be good, but Dorcas taught me this. That's my mother. She's 88 years old. We were raised with this term, shut up and dance. That's what my mother used to teach me. If somebody you don't like says something, shut up and dance. No matter what I tell, shut up and dance. In other words, and she wasn't talking about literally dancing. She was talking about get the job done. Get her done. Do it. Get it done. Whatever it takes. Don't talk back. Get it done. Martha was that person who just, she got to say it. Jesus shows up, Lazarus is dead, and here comes Martha. Could we just act like big Martha, or like Martha is big mama? Let's act like Martha. She weighs about 350 pounds. And Martha come out, she got her apron on. She been in the kitchen. And she, here she come. She got her apron on. And she been baking apple pie and cookies. And here come Martha out the kitchen. And she, I see her drying her hands. And they said, Jesus is finally here. And big Martha, watch the expression on my face. Here she goes. Is he? Finally. You think. She's drying her hands, pulling her apron down. And she says, Lord... If you had been here. See, she just had to say it. Some folks just got to say it. They just got to get it out. She just, hey, if you had been here. Now, some of us, Evangelist Eddie, you're so kind and gracious, filled with love and mercy. You would just smile. You may be thinking it, but you'd never say, had you been here. But Martha, she had to say, had you been been here. My brother would not have, had you been here. Come here, come here, come here. Had you been here, my brother would not have died. And she steps back in a retaliatory fashion. Like, take that, Jesus. How you like me now? I don't take nothing off of nobody. But as she's turning to walk away, something must have happened. After she basically spits out the words of anger, she stops and she turns and she says, but, but, I'm so desperate for a miracle. Sometimes I say what I shouldn't say. Even now, if you just speak the word of life, my brother can live. I've learned I can deal with people who have to say it all, even if they shouldn't. As long as something checks them in their soul and they can come back and say, even now. You know what? Let, let, let me tell you this. It hit me the other day why Martha was really mad. You want to know why Martha was really mad? I'm going to tell you. Reverend Tom, I'm going to tell you why Martha was really mad. You know why Martha was really mad? Martha was really mad because she knew Jesus could have done it, but he didn't. Many Christians get angry with God, not because we don't believe God. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We're angry because we know he could have done it, but he didn't do it. I just said something right there. Don't you miss this. Don't let Dan Willis' emotion in his shirt propped up. Don't miss this. Many Christians get angry with God, not because they don't believe him, but because they do believe and he did not do it yet. I was coming off of a flight the other day. I was coming back from, from Kenya with Pastor Benny. We'd been gone to Kenya for five or six days, whatever it was. Now, my wife is from the hills of West Virginia. And ain't nobody got a tooth in their mouth in West Virginia. Okay, they, they, ain't nobody got no teeth. But they know they got one tooth in the front. But my wife, now thank God, she got to Chicago as a child. So she got all her teeth and she's gorgeous. But she got the thing from West Virginia that's most valuable. She knows how to cook. Oh, my wife can cook. Dear Jesus, I'm going to cry thinking about it in Chicago she she cooks cornbread anybody like cornbread I, I'm not fat this is just cornbread love right here cornbread fried potatoes with onions in them oh glory pinto beans peach 
cobbler sizzling on the stove. My wife knows how to cook. And when I'm gone, the thing I look most forward to is when I come home, I'll open the door and there I'm going to smell the aroma of beans and cornbread, fried potatoes with onions and peach cobbler. I cannot wait. I'm thinking about it all the flight from Kenya. Get this flight over. As soon as I get home, I'm going to eat. And I walk in the door. I open the door and I... Where's my, where's my beans and cornbread? Where's my peach cobbler? Where's my fried potatoes? Linda! That's my wife's name. Linda! And I walked in the living room, and there she sat. One furry slipper not matching the other furry slipper. Rollers in her hair, her, her nightgown on. There she was, no makeup. She had got it together. She said, oh, I just decided to take the day off. I didn't cook today. And she said these words to me. I hope that's okay. And my Martha came out. And I looked at her and I said, sure it's okay. I walked in the other room. I wanted her to hear me stomping. Beans, cornbread, fried potatoes, onions, peach cobbler. I'm mad. I'm upset. Now I got to go get something. She said, McDonald's is down the street. Just go get something. You'll be all right. And it hit me. I was angry because I knew. Watch, I'm finishing. I knew what she was capable of doing, but she had not done it. Many people get angry with God not because they don't believe that he can do it. But they believe he could have. And he didn't. And in that moment, God gave me this message to preach today. God said, turn around, Martha. Turn around. Anger is one thing. But not learning how to bring it under subjection. And be able to say, even now. Even now, come on, love world, play softly, just play softly. Even now, I determined that day I was going to be a yes man. You know, so, so many people, they pride themselves, I'm not a yes man. I don't say yes to everybody. I'm not a yes man. I got news for you. I'm a yes man. If God says to do it, yes, sir. If Pastor Chris says, I want you to go to the other location to... Yes, sir. If Pastor Benny says, yes, sir. Some people probably, I don't say, I'm, no, I don't just say yes. You'll be broke and in poverty. I made up my mind. I don't think this is popular preaching and I've never heard anybody say it. But I made up my mind to be a yes man. To say, yes, sir. Even now. Hear me. I'm going to finish this right now. Bishop Payne is going to come, but I want to open the phones in just a moment. Three friends that you must have to have longevity in ministry. A mentor, a peacemaker, but an even now friend. An even now friend that does not judge the entirety of your life by one moment. But they have the ability to turn and say, even now. I want to talk to, I want to talk to, Right now, there's, there's somebody I want to say this to. You called at the last praise and you gave, but you have not yet given this week because you felt like what you asked God for did not come to pass. I'm going to ask you with everything in me to please listen to me. Please listen from a man who's made more mistakes than you can ever imagine. Dear God, I've gotten it wrong so many times. But here's one thing I'm determined to get right. That if I make a mistake, and I'm a Martha, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to say, even now, and I'm going to fix that situation. I'm going to ask you right now, there's 300 people right now, and you're in an even now situation where you've been upset. You sowed a seed, and what you thought would happen did not happen. Yet, 
I'm going to ask you, get the phone in your hand. I'm done now. I'm done. I'm done. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to call the number on your screen. They're going to put it up there. Get it ready right now. Or on King's Pay, Espies, however you want to do this. But I'm going to ask you right now, I want you to get a seed in the ground. And you know, usually I say an amount. Right now, I'm not even going to say an amount. I want God to tell you what that amount should be. The purpose is that you're going to return and say, God, Eve, this is an even now seed. When the operator answers, I want you to say, I'm going to sow an even now seed. What I wanted to happen didn't happen. But even now, even now, I thought it would have happened last year. And it didn't happen. But even now, even now, are you ready? Get the phone in your hand. On the count of three. God, I feel the Holy Ghost stronger than I probably have ever felt Him in my life. I'm going to ask for my friends to call your love world now. And so a even now seed. One, get the phone in your hand. I'm telling you, you know who it is. Don't you let your anger rob you. Don't you let your disappointment rob you. You make up your mind. I'm going to sow an even now seed. Are you ready? Two. The number is on your screen. When I say three, and I'm going to go back to those phones, Bishop Payne is going to come and take it from here. I want you to pick up that phone and call as quickly as possible. Three. Call it right now. Love World Singers, stand. I'm going back there to the phones. Love World Singers are going to sing one time through while you call. Right now, the phones are open. I want you to call with an even now seed. While the love world singers sing, I'm going back to pray for you on the phone. I'm waiting for your call right now. Sing, love world. Call. I'm waiting on your call right now.
later and ask someone to pray with you, Pastor Dan and and uh, Bishop Mike uh, Smalley is there at the phones, and they're, I think Pastor Ray may be there with them, and they're taking your calls, and they're praying over your request. Choir, could I ask you to just sing one more chorus of that song while people are making their calls, and then I'm going to come back, and I have a real, real rhema word for you. I believe that's going to be a blessing to you, and it's going to help you. But right now, I want to give you an opportunity to connect with Love World Network with your seed. Because your seed can build a bridge between your lack and God's supply. Your shortage and God's abundance. That seed will connect you to an anointing that will bring the supernatural provision of God in your life. And we don't want you to miss this opportunity. So as the choir sings one more chorus, Go to the phones now, and we'll be right back with the Word of God in just a moment. Lord, King of Kings, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, and Lord and above all, yes, you are heads of the Lord, Holy God, you are the righteous judge. last few moments the presence of God has come in a different dimension and level in the studio choir thank you so much for your ministry you're continually taking us into the presence of God and I know you feel what I feel there I believe that same presence is in that prayer room right now And you can go to the phone and you can make a connection. You can find someone to agree with you. I was just thinking today, uh, Brother Eddie, that one of the first telethons in the Bible was when Elijah went to the widow's house. It was a famine and she was in need, but God spoke to the prophet to make a house call. And our dear man of God, Pastor Chris, heard God's voice years ago from the Lord to make house calls. Through this television network, he making house calls all around the world. We read the pledges from Australia, from the United Kingdom, from Uganda, from different places. Love World's making a house call because there's someone there in need. Isn't it wonderful that we have a Savior that knows where we are knows what we have need of, and sends someone to us to tell us there's a better way. There is hope in a hopeless situation. There is the supernatural when the natural is not enough. That's what Love World is all about. I know we all go through things. We all go through battles. But I always can pick up my smart device wherever I am, and I can pick up Love World. 
And if I just tune in for a few moments, I'll hear a song that will lift my spirit. I'll hear Pastor Chris or some other great minister, Pastor Tom. I'll hear those great ministers bring a word that will just lift my spirit. And that's what Telethon is all about. God has brought us together from around the world to be here to tell you that Jesus is alive and well. The word of God is still true. The devil is still defeated. You're still the righteousness of God in Christ, and it's going to be all right. Could we just praise him a moment? Could we just lift our hands and glorify him for just a moment? His presence is here. His healing anointing is here. His delivering power is here right now. If you'll just reach out, if you'll just reach out to him right now, he'll reach out to you. Things can turn around today. God sent Elijah to a widow who was concerned about her child. She had one meal left and was ready to die. But here comes a word from a man of God that says there's hope. It's going to be all right. That's why we're here. There is hope. It's going to be all right. Could we just give the Lord one more praise offering? Hallelujah. Come on, just shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Give me just a moment. I want to talk to you about seed. You can be seated if you'd like. We're going to begin today in uh, Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. And how God is concerned about seed. On Genesis 1 and 11, he created seed. And he, in, and he established the entire universe on the seed principle. And here he, Isaiah is saying, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven. Now, you that are here in Nigeria, I don't know, but how, how much snow do you have here? That's what I thought. No snow here, but all over the world, uh, there, there, there's times when snow comes down, rain and snow comes down from heaven. And let me tell you from an agricultural point of view what this means to a farmer. The last harvest that he reaped, Brother Mike, took the nutrients out of the soil. And so to plant in that soil without the rain and the snow is putting good seed in bad ground. Because it takes the nutrients that come in the rain and the snow to replenish the earth so that when the seed goes in, the necessary ingredients are in the earth to cause germination. Germination is like resurrection. It brings the life out of that seed. A seed is three parts. It's a hard outer shell. It's an embryo, and then it's an endosperm. And that hard outer shell has to come off so that the embryo can come out. That's called germination in agricultural terms. How many of you are still with me? But you see, germination alone can't produce a harvest. I'll tell you in a moment what will, but let's finish this. For as the rain and snow comes down out of heaven, returns not hither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud. That's what it's saying. Bud is when germination takes place and the plant comes out of the ground and, it, and a bud is placed on that plant, that it may give seed to the sower. What? That it might give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, that it may give Seed to the sower and bread to the eater. See, there's a seed in every harvest and a harvest in every seed. See, when you sow your seed in God's work, there's going to be a harvest that's going to come back, and your harvest is going to be a lot more than your seed. And so you're going to have seed in the harvest to continue to sow. Now, I want you to know, and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians now, uh, well, let me read. Let me, let me stay there and read verse 11 before we go, if you don't mind. Put that back on the screen, if you don't mind. Verse 11 says, now watch this. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. What, so shall what the word be? It'll be like the rain and the snow that comes down out of heaven and puts the nutrients back in the earth. Every time we as Christians give birth to a harvest, it takes something out of us. You see, you can't reap tomorrow's harvest on yesterday's experience. You've got to go back to the Word of God, and you've got to get back in the Word of God and let the Word of God replenish the faith 
and the grace and the mercy that came out of you when you gave birth to that last harvest. Are, are you with me? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, that's why the Word of God is important. It's not something you carry to look religious. It's the Word of God. And if you put the Word of God in you, the Word of God is seed, and the Word of God will replenish what the last harvest took out, just like the rain and snow replenishes the earth. All right, now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, and let's continue talking. It seems like God is wanting us to teach a little bit more today, Brother Mike. I really enjoyed your message. I really enjoyed your message. Man, you made me hungry talking about that southern food. Uh, it said, now that he that ministereth seed to the sower. That word ministereth there in the original, it's, it's where we get the word uh, a choreograph or put into position or better yet, formation. This is, Pastor Chris declared, the month of formation, right? So now he that is in formation, seed is given to the sower, both to minister bread for your food and to multiply the seed that is sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. As Jesus was teaching on seed in Matthew chapter 6, He's teaching on economics in verse 20. He said, uh, 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 don't take thought of what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or your body, what you're going to put on. That's economics, right? How many of you are familiar with economics? You have to buy groceries. You have to buy. You have to pay rent. You have to, you know, uh, pay a, a mortgage. You, we're uh, familiar with economics. Jesus said, don't take thought about these things. He said, uh, look at these birds. They don't sow and they don't reap, yet your father takes care of them. And if you're not careful, you'll think, well, I don't have to do anything. Uh, God will take care of me. I don't have to uh, take any actions on my part. God said he'd take care of the birds. God will take care of me. And, but he also says that birds don't sow and reap and they don't gather into barns. Now, the only reason a farmer needs a barn is for abundance or excess. In Proverbs 3, 9, he said, honor the Lord with your substance. And what will happen? He said, your barns will be filled with plenty. So God's concerned about barns, and your barn may be your bank account. I don't know. But God's concerned about barns. But you don't need a barn unless you got access or excess. How many of you are, are, are still with me here? And so he said, uh, we need to read the rest of it, because if you stop right there, you'll live like a bird. These same birds in Matthew 6 you find over in Matthew 13 eating seed. See, birds are seed eaters, not seed sowers. And we got people in the body of Christ that they live off the harvest that somebody else sowed. They never sow their own harvest. See, they eat seed that somebody else sowed instead of sowing their own seed. Isn't it about time that you got responsible for your own harvest? Isn't it about time you took responsibility for your own harvest? Because Jesus said, you're better than the birds. How am I better than the birds? I can sow and I can reap and I can have a barn and I can put ex excess in my barn. And if difficult times come along, I don't sweat it because I got a barn and I got things in the barn that God has provided. You see, if you don't sow in bad times, you won't harvest in good times. And God wants you to have seed. If you don't have seed, it tells me one of two things about you. Number one, you're not a sower. Number two, you ate your seed. Isn't it quiet in here? I, I said, you either ate your seed or you're not a sower because he said he gives seed to the sower. He choreographs. He puts you in formation. He brings things and brings you to places where you have seed, where he can provide seed for you. God's trying to get seed to you, choir. God's trying to get seed to you, musicians, preachers sitting here. God's trying to get seed to you. Somebody's looking for you right now that God has a sign to be an agent to bless your life. Come on, come on. It, 
And, and it's not always at church. I've been in restaurants sitting at the table, and somebody walk over and say, I saw you on television and lay money on my, on my table, glory to God, because God had assigned them to be where they were. He assigned me to be where I was so he could give seed to the sower. He didn't, they didn't know when they laid the money there what I would been praying about, I, I, you know, I, uh, paying off churches or putting Bibles into Pakistan or, or something else. But they were assigned by God. They don't even know sometimes why they did it. They just came over and obeyed the Lord. Are you ready for that? God can assign people to you. Oh, I've been so blessed over my life. When, when, I, when I was in debt and God wanted to get me out of debt, he assigned people to bless me. I owed $30,000 at one bank, and I went over there to tell them that I want to make payments. When I got over there, they handed me a piece of paper and said, somebody came by here two days ago and paid that $30,000 note off for you. Are you still here? I was six months behind on my house payment, went to the bank, and God had talked to the bank president to give me the deed to my house and Cancel a 30-year mortgage. Are you still here? I'm talking about this God that can assign seed to the sower. I'm talking about this God that can change everything financially in your life if you just believe him and trust him and get, how do I say this? We need to stop looking at currency or money as currency or money. We need to start looking at it as seed. You see what I'm saying? When, you, when, you, when, when God's talking to you, he's talking to you about seed. What are you going to do with what he put in your hand? Come on. If God can't talk to you about a seed, it's useless to talk to him about a harvest. I only have a few moments, but I want to continue this for just a few moments. Uh, a seed is something God gives you that you can give away that the Bible said will make you wealthy in every way. Can I, can I read uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10? Can I read this to you in the Message Bible? It says, the most generous God gives you seed and is extravagant with you. Hello, I'm not talking about just a little seed. It says in the Message Bible, uh, the most generous God, it's on your screen, the most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread from a, is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something that you can give away which grows into full form robust in God. Come on. He gives you something you can give away that will come, become greater than what you have in your hand. Isn't it good you can sow one seed and reap a 100,000 seeds? Isn't it good that you can sow two seeds? And Isn't it good that multiplication is activated when the seed is sown? And God is extravagant with you. Now, the, 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 se the seventh verse of 2 Corinthians 9 in the Amplified Bible, it said, God prizes above every other thing. My, you want to know what? God prizes above every other thing. It says it, he prizes above every other thing and is unwilling to abandon a prompt giver whose heart is in giving. Come on. Come on. Think about that. Let each one, as he made up his mind and purpose in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully under compulsion, for God loves and he takes pleasure and prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon my God, can you imagine it? He's not going to abandon you. You may feel like that, that nobody cares and that nobody, that nothing's going to happen. But just remember, God's not have, not, God has not abandoned you. It may be the last day. It may be the last moment. It may be the last opportunity. But God always comes through. God has never failed me, Pastor Dan. Has God ever failed you, Brother Smalley? Has God ever failed you, Brother Eddie? Has God ever failed you, Brother Kay? Has God ever failed you? Oh, I'm telling you, I God will not fail us. He will not abandon a giver. He'll pass around a lot of religious folks to get to a sower. Glory to God. He'll pass a lot of, he'll pass around folks that some
sometimes not even living as good as they should be living to find somebody that's sowing in the kingdom of God and bless their life. I'm talking about seed. What I kept thinking last night as Pastor Benny was preaching and Pastor Chris was talking, what can a seed do? Can I tell you two or three things a seed can do? Number one, a seed can build a bridge between your lack and God's supply. A seed can build a bridge between your shortage and God's abundance. The seed can build a bridge between your natural and God's supernatural. The, the seed can build a, a bridge between your supply and God's source. I'm telling you, a seed will connect you to a supernatural manifestation of prosperity and wealth. Listen, when I was writing my book on seedonomics, it went to the editor, and, and, and it was ready to be printed, and God said, there's one more chapter that needs to be included. I was in prayer. He said, I want to give you the definition of the word poor and the word rich. P-O-O-R. Say that with me. P-O-O-R. That's how you spell poor. Passing over opportunity repeatedly. That's how you remain poor. See, God gives you seed and then gives you a season and an opportunity to sow that seed. You didn't plan on sowing, but all of a sudden you were praying, and God said, I want you to sow in the love world. You didn't plan on sowing that seed. You had other plans for that seed. But a preacher comes on and says, God's talking to somebody to sow a $1,000 seed. God's speaking to somebody to sow a $10,000 seed. Last night I prayed with someone on the phone that had a business that was going under. They, they called and they, and they made a, a $25,000 gift to Love World. Why? They said God spoke to us that if we did what God told us to do, he would turn the business around. I started praying on the other end of the line. They started speaking in tongues. The Spirit of God moved on the other end of the line. That's what a seed can do. If your business is going under, a seed can turn that business around. Oh, I can't get no help in here. Amen. But I'm telling you, I'm a living witness. A seed can turn that business around. A seed can turn a church around. A seed can turn a family around. A seed can and turn a ministry around. A seed is the strongest, most powerful thing that God ever entrusted you with. But every time God creates an opportunity and you pass that opportunity, a, a past opportunity to sow is a missed opportunity to, to reap. I said a missed opportunity to sow is a missed opportunity to reap. And that opportunity may never come to you again. I look back over my life, and there have been defining moments where God created a moment. And, I, and, and you know, when, a, when God creates a defining moment, you either have to define that moment or that moment will define you. Did you hear what I said? I'm not going to be defined as a stingy, ungrateful, unthankful child of God. I want to be defined, God, I've... I've done everything you ever asked me to do. I've given everything you ever told me to give. I sowed every seed you ever told me to sow. I want to hear when I get to heaven, Brother Tom, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yesterday, Brother Tom had a beautiful tie on. I love the ties that these gentlemen wear over here in Nigeria, how they sparkle. I didn't have any sparkly ties, you know, and, and, and I wanted one. And, 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 I, and I looked at Brother Tom's like this, and then and I, and I walked off. And, and then last night he came in with a little gift bag, and look what I got. I got me a sparkly tie. Glory to God. Ain't that pretty? Glory to God. That, that, that's not just a tie to me, Brother Tom. It's a seed. It's a seed. I got that tie and tied it this morning. As I'm tying it, I'm saying, Lord, bless Brother Tom. Hallelujah. Give him more ties than he's got room for. God bless him because this tie is a seed, and God promise to multiply the seed. Every time I go to the mission field, I take a guitar with me because I know somebody I'm going to meet needs a guitar. I took one to Trinidad with me, and, and there was a girl there, the pastor's granddaughter. She was learning to play guitar so she could lead worship. I had a beautiful, expensive guitar, and I asked her, I said, do you have a guitar? She said, no. I said, well, 
This is yours. I need to use it the rest of the meeting, but when I finish, it's yours. And I got a video a few weeks later, and she's on the platform playing that guitar and leading worship. But you know what? I got guitars all over my office. I got guitars all over my walls. People give me guitars everywhere I go. You know why? Because you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. If I uh, come on, if come on, you reap what you sow. That's what the Bible said. You reap what you sow. The seed produces after its kind. What? Look at look at your neighbor. And say, what can a seed do? Hallelujah! What can a seed do? Let me quickly. Number one, a seed can speak to God about your situation. Ask Cornelius. Number two, a seed can open the vaults of God. Asked the queen of Sheba. She brought a seed to Solomon before she left. In 1 Kings 10, he took her to the royal bounty where all the gold and silver and all of the valuables were taken from enemies. He took her to the royal bounty. He opened the door to the royal bounty. He said, queen, before you go back, you take anything you want. Take anything you want. A seed will open the vaults of God. Number three, a seed will call things that be not as though they already were. I said seeds will call things that be. You may not have what you believe in God for today, but your seed is calling it into existence. Oh, I wish I could get some help. You may not have the debt-free house, but your seed will call that debt-free house into existence. You may not have a debt-free car, but the seed will call that debt-free car into existence. Why? Because you put that seed in the ground and you said, this is my debt-free house. This is my debt-free car. This is a better job. This is an increase in in my race. This is a, a, a promotion on my job. Oh, come on. You name that seed. You talk to that seed. When God created seed, God spoke to seed. Come on. You need to talk to your seed. Tell your seed you got an assignment. Now you go out and you t- and, and you talk to, to people about my need. Just give that seed an assignment. I wish I had another hour to preach, but I don't. I got to close. I want to number, number four. Your seed will give you a basis for expectation. You have no expectation for a harvest if you don't have a seed in the ground. Did you get that? You don't have it. I have people come up to me all the time, and they say, I am believing God for a new car. I'm believing God for a new car. I said, well, what have you sowed? Well, I haven't really sowed, but I'm believing God for a new car. Would you pray for me? I said, no, I don't have time. I can't pray for you to get a harvest if you don't have a seed. If you want to live in expectancy, sow every day. And you'll live in expectancy every day. Just play gently there. Hallelujah. Number five, Pastor Dan and these dear ministers behind me are going to come and join me. We're going to pray the final prayer for this session. But number five, seeds create an atmosphere of attraction. Brother Danny, if I take a, a kernel of corn and put it in the ground, it vibrates and gives off a sound. I have videos where scientists have measured the ground vibrating from the sound given off by the, by the corn. Now, when that plant comes up and a bud is on it. And here's what I want to tell you. It's not enough for your seed to germinate. Your seed has to pollinate, which is conception. If that bud dies and falls to the ground, there's no harvest. But that plant vibrates to call bats, bees, and birds to pollinate it so you can have a harvest. Amen. Amen. So it creates an attraction. 
Bishop Payne, you have to return to this. You have to return to finishing this. Bishop Payne, you have to return to this. Love World singers are singing as we leave you. I want you. This is your opportunity. You've heard the word today. Bishop Payne, when he said it builds a bridge, that was enough to pick up your phone right there. What a seed will do. Stay tuned to your love world as we leave you for this session. We'll be right back. Jesus loves you. Pastor Chris loves you. Pastor Benny loves you. And we're waiting on your phone call right now. Sing, love world singers. Extravagance of your love. Sense of your creation. 